thank you, first of all, for organizing this panel on such an important and timely topic. Uh, three things I want to say before I get started. The first one is what a pleasure it is to be part of this event. In my first year at NSF, I attended this one, I think, was in Montana. I'm not sure. And you can see how a gra great vision has the ability to bring people together and take ownership of that, and it turns into a revolution, right? And I'm sure this is not the first time Larry's done that, uh, but it's just amazing. And so I'm here back uh, in my final year at NSF, and it's, it's just to see how, how this thing is moving forward. Uh, second thing is to thank Lauren and the other <laughs> contributors that report. Um, it has had such an impact at NSF. Um, and uh, you, you can see we are borrowing many of the words from that report in what we are doing. Uh, and so thank you for doing that and doing it so well. Uh, and you'll see that in influencing what we do at NSF moving forward. So thank you. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things that Amy has already covered in her brilliant talk. And so thank you, Amy, for setting the stage. Um, all right. Um, I'd like to start with this just to set the stage, uh, and it's, uh, I guess, not uh, required for this audience, but let me repeat, right? So we at OAC, as an office, uh, aim to support cyber infrastructure for enabling uh, innovation, research, and all the science and engineering research and education. And we look at cyber infrastructure broadly, um, not just big compute, uh, little compute as well, uh, but also networking and software and test beds and services, and I think most importantly, people, right? And, and we are trying very hard to make sure that these pieces can actually come together and work to, together towards enabling science and not siloed. And as you can see, over the years, we've tried to move things together and, and really think of this as an ecosystem. And we also realize that uh, this is not static and has to evolve. Technologies evolve. Science moves forward, needs change. So how do we build something that can reflect that? And, and there's a URL here which sort of documents many of our thinking and through our blueprints, through our vision documents on, on what this means. And, and the reason we do this is this, right? It, it is having a tremendous impact, right? This is the, again, imaging of the black hole which used a lot of resources from PATH, OSG, and other, and Frontera, and other uh, systems we have funded. That's great work out here at UCSD uh, by Romy Amaro, where she said what happens when, uh, you know, with uh, the propagation of the COVID-2 virus through respiratory aerosols, and there's work here on Frontera. I know Dan's here in the audience, which is looking at what happens to better understand these local hydration from supercell thunderstorms. How can uh, studying uh, the food chains, uh, understand uh, what happens with our supply chains, and you know predict these black swan events that we've seen, uh, and then again, how can we actually have a huge impact through some of the inno uh, innovations and and uh, funding that we have done through uh, different uh, tools? Here it was an intrusion detection, which is now had a tremendous impact, right? And this is just a sampling of the many things that OEC enables, right? And we do this by investing in an uh, ecosystem of, of services, right? And, and again, Amy showed this, and you can see it's, it has some of the big compute, but really we have broadened this to include uh, capacity systems, uh, systems such as uh, Voyager and, and, and Expanse, uh, Cloud Bank, and, and, and Jetstream and, and uh, experimental systems, Okami, right? So it's, it's a huge ecosystem that provides a very diverse set of capabilities, uh, services uh, that can enable science, right? And increasingly, we're realizing that that's not enough, right? And Lauren just uh, very articulated that really, really well, that it's, it's good to have these capabilities, right? But how do you make sure it can really have the impact on science. How do you make sure that everybody uh, can benefit from it? How do you make sure that we truly uh, democratize this, right? And so 
it took me some time to realize this, right? And we've been having a lot of this conversation um, in the office, thanks to the Missing Millions report uh, that really very nicely outlined some of this, right? So how do you make sure that these capabilities uh, can really impact science all around? How do you make sure that broad, fair, equitable access to this ecosystem all right, can, can enable science, because that's the only way we can democratize science. That's the only way we can make sure that everybody can really contribute to this, uh, to the innovation, to the research uh, ecosystem that we have, right? Uh, and there are, exist barriers, and, and, and again, Lawrence already articulated many of them. There's the knowledge barriers, making sure that people understand what the resources have, aware of what's out there, aware how to use it, right? There are technical barriers. How do you connect to it? How do you make sure that you have the right uh, software stacks? You have the right infrastructure to be able to connect and leverage that to access the data. I remember in my OOI days, right, when we, we had this great underwater volcanic eruptions and everybody was downloading high definition streaming video, right, we got some requests that said, uh, can, you, can we send you a disk so that you can load the data and send it back? Right? And, and that's the difference. There are people who could do the research and publish something the next day, and the others had to wait. Right? And that's, that's just not right. We can do better. Right? So there are definitely uh, technical barriers. But I think more importantly, I think there are these social barriers. Right? Right? Recognizing that this is important. We have to invest in it because that's how we enable our researchers to be part of this broader research ecosystem. Right? And how do we change that awareness at the local level? Um, and the complex trade-offs that you have to balance. And I think that's important, right? We cannot pick one metric and say we are only going to build a high-performance system with the maximum uh, flops, right? It has to really balance these different objectives and be able to uh, build a, an ecosystem that meets these different needs. And that's hard, right? And, and we have just started taking some baby steps there. Uh, I will not say anything more on this report except thank you. Um, so how do you realize a, a cyber infrastructure ecosystem for all, right? And we've started taking some of these. The first thing is that you need to have the right building block, right? You need to have the right set of capabilities, capacities that meet this diversity of needs, right? And, and, and so we have to implement this scalable ecosystem where you have these different things from uh, resources and, and, and software and tools and, and, and infrastructure that can meet the diversity of needs, but you also have to partner, right? If you can't do it all. So you bring in other investments that are being made so you can truly have an ecosystem. Um, and then you make sure that everybody can access it, right? So even though you're building it, you have to make sure that, that it's not just open. It's not just open access that everybody can go and get it, right? You have to make sure that it's equitable access. And that's really what Lauren talked about, accessibility is the access and the ability, right? So it, you have to move, take a step beyond that and really make sure that you have equitable access, right? Addressing these different barriers that you have, right? And, and then build, and I think the key um, piece here is having this network of experts that are local, they understand what local needs are, and are able to work with their community at the institutional level, at the regional level, and bring the awareness on and the knowledge on how to access these investments that we are making, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, I think we need to make sure that this is robust and reliable, and it's there, right? It's not that it's... Uh, something that, that people get used to and it, it goes away. So you have to make sure you are creating a, a platform that can then truly enable, enable science. And this vision is not unique to NSF, right? You'll see these coming up in a lot of other things that are happening. Uh, in 2020, you released a follow-on to the National Strategic Computing Initiative, uh, the FACE report, Future Advanced Computing Ecosystem, which has elements of this vision in there. Um, the National Discovery Cloud uh, and the National Secure Data Service that are uh, moving right now have exactly this vision underlying them. Uh, there was a memo uh, that came out in summer. Uh, this is uh, 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 talking about making data or the results, actually not data, it's just, it's the results of federally funded research open and equitable, right? So it makes sure that all research, uh, all results are, are made accessible immediately without any embargo, and that includes data, right? Includes software, 
So, and, and in terms of equity, it says equity in the sense that there is, everybody can comply with this requirement. So you have the infrastructure and the services and expertise so that everybody can contribute to the data. But on the other side, you also want to make sure that everybody can benefit from that, right? And you're not creating something where, like, like I talked about OI, where you have open data, right, but not everybody can benefit from that, right? And so that's a really tall order, and the agencies are working very hard. Our plans are due later this month, our initial ones, and it's, uh, you have until 2025 to actually implement this, right? So this is an amazing move, and the subcommittee on open science is thinking hard about what the infrastructure has to look like to really meet this, right? Uh, and then finally, the National AI Research Resource uh, Task Force released its report. Uh, it was, again, put together by an amazing committee, right? There was Mike Norman was part of it, Dan Stanzioni was part of it, and there were a uh, uh, total 12 members of, as part of it. And that goal was to create a resource that truly democratizes AI research and address, addressing the same thing so that everybody can contribute to that. And not just being able to diversify the ability to contribute and benefit from AI, but it has other impacts. Right now that everybody can contribute in it, you have more chances that you have data sets and re algorithms that, have, uh, that are not as biased. Right? And so there's, there are a lot of impacts here. Uh, I recommend that you look at that, and, uh, and we are trying very hard to see how we can move that forward. I'm going to stop there with just highlighting a couple of things we are doing, right? Access, we're trying to see how do we uh, reduce barriers to access, right? We had this typical double jeopardy in our allocation system where you'd get your research and then write a proposal and it might get, you might get an allocation and then you can start your research. Can we streamline that? And we started piloting that, but that's not enough. We clearly have to do a lot more. Data is a huge problem, so how do we really address the data problem so that we can make sure that the results, the data that's out there is really accessible. Everybody can benefit from it, contribute to it. It requires things like what Frank talked about and what Lauren talked about, and we all think about how do we create a national data infrastructure that can truly uh, make that data access and uh, uh, benefits from data uh, uh, equitable. And Amy highlighted some of that. And I think the most important piece is building this network of experts, right? How do we create a network? How do we build a community of experts that can work together and enable the researchers, the students, right, and bring them and, and allow them to benefit from, from this infrastructure? The Skype program that Amy talked about is our first step in this direction. But clearly, we have to do this together, right? Uh, and as we build this community, uh, we want to make sure that whether they're NSF funded or otherwise, can we bring our, uh, our experts and make them part of this community? Uh, I'm going to stop there. I hope I didn't go too much over my time, Lauren. And uh, let me give the podium back to you.